Now, again, we're continuing our series on faith that works when life doesn't. And we've been talking about the idea of how that during this pandemic, there's so many things that have affected our lives in so many different ways. And how that, what do we do in a crisis? How do we have a faith that works when life really doesn't, when there's so many things going against us? And we, we talked about this little book of James, how that there was a church there that was in the midst of a crisis. They were, he talks about, in the very beginning of the book of James, how the church was scattered. And the reason they were scattered was because they were in that crisis that they were in. Because of their faith, they were being scattered. They were being persecuted. They were being killed. They were being driven out of their homes. They had all these different problems. And James, the little book of James, teaches us what to do in difficult days. And so we talked about several different things. We talked about Last week we were, and we're continuing that study, a faith that stays calm in a crisis. One of the things that I have discovered that it's a lot easier to get angry in difficult days. And there's a lot of pressure on us, you know. We're, we're dealing with our kids being at home a lot. A lot more than we ever anticipated them being at home. The teachers who are working with them have a lot of stresses on them trying to keep up with the online part of it and the, and the, the, the kids and keeping them safe and all these different things. We have people who've lost their jobs, the people who, who are struggling to keep their businesses going, all these different things that have happened. People that are getting ill. We're in a political struggle right now. We are as polarized as I've ever seen as a people, and it causes stress. And usually when we are in stress, Anger flares. Now, you remember last week we talked about anger and the idea that all anger is not sinful. Jesus was angry. God has been angry. We know the flood. God got angry because the people weren't doing what they ought to do. There is a place for anger in your life. But uncontrolled anger causes problems. And I know that most of us struggle with that. Now, you may not, but... Uh, you know, they say, again, confession is good for the soul. I, I struggle with that sometimes. And we all struggle with it. How do we deal with it? How, what's the right way to do it? And again, when I do this, I preach to me as much as I preach to anybody else. I look at what I need to be doing, and then I know if I need to be doing it, maybe some of you need to be doing it too. But we talked about, first of all, realize the cost of uncontrolled anger. And we talked about that last week, how the idea that, that anger costs you when it's uncontrolled. And I talked uh, uh, about, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, Ryan, I, I, talk, I talked about Joey from Rome, Georgia, me and him going golfing and how he used to throw his clubs. Did he do that with you? You ever see him do stuff like that? He'd throw his clubs. I, I went with him one time. I said, before you throw that, just give it to me. I'll put it in my bag. You know, and, uh, but it cost you. I finally told him I wasn't even going to play with him. If we couldn't have fun, I wasn't going to play. I said, because if you get mad at yourself, I can't imagine what you're thinking when I'm out here looking for balls. But, you know, we were... Uh, we had all these different people, you know, people get angry. And again, I'm too cheap to break something, so I don't have that problem of breaking things, but it does hurt relationships. It costs you in relationships. It costs you in other things. It could cost you your job if you have an outburst, uncontrolled anger. And we talked about it. A hot-tempered man gets in all kinds of trouble. And that's so true. And in Proverbs 14, 29, anger causes mistakes. And we all know that we've made mistakes when we were angry. Uh, Proverbs 14 and verse 17, people with hot tempers do foolish things. And, and you, you see some of these things that people do today, and you think, what were they thinking? Well, they weren't. Anger got control. Then we said, number two, resolve to manage it. Understand that it costs you. Number two, resolve to manage it. Make a resolution that you're going to, you know you've got this problem, I'm going to try to manage it. A fool gives full vent to his anger, but a wise man keeps himself under control. Then we talked about the idea of reflecting before reacting. Reflecting before reacting. And that's where we got to last week, where it says, my dear friend, uh, brothers and sisters, always be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry because human anger will never bring about the righteous life that God desires. And we, we talked about those different things of how we need to do. And this passage that we're looking at today, James gives us three action steps 
in how to reflect before reacting, how to reflect before doing something. Notice these three phases. Number one, he says, be quick to listen. Be quick to listen. Do you know that studies show that the, the quickest way to diffuse someone else's anger is just to calmly and genuinely listen to them? That's it. Use your ears. When you don't feel like you're being listened to, it just makes you that much more angry. When you're angry, don't talk first. Listen first. If that's all you get out of this message, you're going to take a giant step towards managing your anger if you will learn to listen first. Be quick to listen. Don't be quick to speak. He says, be quick to listen. Why? Because listening calms people down, calms you down, cal you know, calms them down. It's soothing. It relieves fear. When people feel listened to, it reduces their frustration. It eases their hurt. He says, reflect before reacting. You just listen. Be quick to listen. The second thing we saw was be slow to speak. Now, why does James say be slow to speak? Because anger control basically is mouth control. Anger control is a matter of mouth control. You tame your temper by taming your tongue. Now, James, we already talked about the tongue a few weeks ago about, you know, the, the most dangerous thing in all the world. You remember that, kids? And well, it was your tongue, wasn't it? And uh, they got to come up here and feel a real tongue right up here in the front of the auditorium. And, and they saw the dangers of a tongue. And, and that's the truth. Now, James is going to have a lot more to say about that in the next chapter that we've already talked about. Anger management starts by watching your words. Because when you're angry, you're apt to say things maybe you shouldn't have said. Maybe that you regret that you say. If you're going to learn to control your anger, you must learn to muzzle your mouth. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 11, a stupid man gives free reign to his anger. A wise man waits and lets it get grow cool. Notice now, delay causes your anger to cool down. Circle the word waits. By the way, cool is a biblical term. Chill out is a biblical term. He says, a wise man lets his anger chill out. He lets it cool down. You see, delay is the greatest remedy to anger because the longer you hold your temper, the more it improves. It gives you something time to reflect and to think through you know, Jefferson, the second president of the United States, said this, when you're angry, count to ten. He was the one that came up with that. When you're angry, count to ten. Then he went on to say, if you're really angry, count to 100. That was, he, he was the one that came up with that. Why? Because delay tends to calm you down. Now, the third part of reflecting before reacting. The third thing James says here, he says, be quick to listen, be slow to speak. Then he says, be slow to get angry. Now, if you do the two, per, the two first parts of this verse, the third part is pretty automatic. If you are quick to listen, if you are slow to speak, you automatically will be slower to get angry. Now, I want you to notice that he twice uses the word slow. Two times he uses the word slow in one sentence. Why? Because James is trying to get you to, to delay your response when you get angry. Delay, as I said, is the greatest remedy to anger. Now, what do you do during delays? You're, you're waiting, you're cooling down. What do you do during that wait? The answer is you analyze and you try to understand your anger. You analyze it, and you try to understand it. That's what he talks about in Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 11. A man's wisdom gives him patience. The more you understand, the more patient you're going to be. Now, write this down, okay? Write down. The more I understand my anger, the more understanding I'll be. The more I understand my anger, the more understanding I will be. Now, that's not only true of yourself, but it's also true of others. The more I understand my spouse's anger, the more understanding I'll be of my spouse. The more I understand my child's anger, the more I'll be understanding of my child. 
The more I understand my co-worker's anger or my neighbor's anger, the more understanding I will be to them. Now, let me give you three questions. Write these down. Three questions to ask yourself that you consider, when you're considering your, your, your holding back, you just put these three in your mind. When you're angry, the first question to ask is, why? Why am I angry? Then the second question is, the second question is, what do I really want? Because something's being, you know, frustrating here. What do I really want? Why am I angry? What do I really want? And the third thing is, how can I get it? Why am I angry? What do I want? How can I get it? What am I saying is this, is if you reflect before reacting, then you can identify the cause, the root cause of your anger. Typically, the root cause of anger is one of three things. It is hurt, or it is frustration, or it is fear. One of those three things. First, hurt when you're wounded, emotionally wounded, or physically wounded. You know, you, what do you do when you hit your thumb with a hammer? You get angry. You know, you start saying things maybe you shouldn't say. That, you know, you'll really find out what a person's down in. You know, you'll find out what's in the well. Just hit him on the finger with a hammer. You'll find out. Ah, because, you know, what's in the well comes up, uh, what's, it comes up in the bucket. I mean, you know, and it, it does. You know, so, so you hit your thumb, you get angry. When you get hurt, hurt causes anger. Second, frustration causes anger. When I get irritated, when you're forced to wait, when nothing works, when you can't control the situation, the more you need to control things in life, the higher your anger quotient is going to be. High control equals high anger. So frustration causes anger. The third thing in anger is fear. When we get threatened, when we feel attacked, when we feel afraid, we get anger. Anger and insecurity go together. The more insecure I feel, the more angry I'm going to be. While you're being quick to listen and being slow to speak, what are you doing? I would encourage you to to silently pray, Psalm 141 and verse 3, Lord, help me control my tongue. Help me be careful about what I say. By the way, I'll just throw this in there. The number one cause of reacting before you reflect, the cause you to react before you reflect is alcohol. That's what they say. Proverbs 20 and verse 1 says this, Drinking too much makes you loud and foolish. It's stupid to get drunk because you don't think straight. Because what did, what did they say? You lose your inhibitions. How many arguments have taken place in alcohol because we reacted before we reflected instead of, and, and, instead of doing what we need to do? Instead of reflecting before we react. All right, let's review. Step number one, I realize the cost of anger. It's not worth it. The price is too expensive. There's always a payment to be made when I lose my temper. Step number two, resolve to manage it. Make a decision. Stop saying I can't control it and start saying with God's help I can. Step number three, reflect before reacting. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Now the fourth step, release my anger appropriately. Remember I said the problem isn't anger. The problem is not anger. The problem is inappropriate release of that anger. Ephesians chapter 4, 26 says this. If you become angry, don't let your anger lead into sin. Now realize that you can get angry and not sin. It is not wrong to get angry. That's what the verse says. It says, don't let your anger lead you into sin. Now, what is he saying? There's a right way and there's a wrong way to express your anger. There's an appropriate and an inappropriate way to express your anger. There's a helpful way and there's a harmful way. It's not the anger. It's how you release it. See, most of us express angers in ways that actually move us further away from our goal. It doesn't bring us closer to what we want. Our, our hurts healed or our frustration resolved or our, feel, our fears relieved. No, no, it moves us further away. Now, while I'm on this, I want to expose a myth that a lot of people think when it comes to anger. It's simply just not true. And here's the idea, that everybody has a set amount of anger, okay? You know, how many gallons of anger do you have? 
Like, like you carry a bucket around, you know, the anger bucket, and you got so much in that bucket. And the myth is that if I can just empty that bucket every now and again, blow all my anger off, if I empty that bucket of anger, I won't have any more anger in it. it, it, it like, you know, an outburst. Now, and I pour it all out, then we're going to feel a whole lot better because we poured out the bucket because we only have so much anger. That sounds nice, but it's not true. Why? Because, friends, you don't have a bucket of anger. You have a factory of anger, and you'll just produce some more. You have a factory of anger. That's human nature. Research shows that anger produces more anger. Aggression, aggression produces more aggression. Outburst leads to more outbursts. The more anger leads to more anger, not a reduction. And so things like, well, I'll feel a lot better if I just get it all out. No, actually, it becomes a habit. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 1, a gentle answer quiets anger, but a harsh one stirs it up. Why does a gentle answer quiet anger? Well, first, giving a gentle answer is going, going to quiet your own soul. Having, have you noticed the louder you speak, the angrier you become? You intentionally talk softer, your anger goes down. Now, I, I, you know, this is what I struggle with because I, I'm, I'm a loud person anyway. You know, I, I have just, I don't know why, but I am. Maybe it's because I'm hard of hearing and I speak up loud, I don't know. But, but I do. I, I walk in the room and the kids were, uh, uh, when the kids were young, I know when, when Elsie was young, I could make that baby cry just by walking in the room. Now, she knows now, but uh, I, I, I'm loud, but the thing is, the louder you are, the more your anger gets. What's the best way to deal with anger in yourself? Well, don't suppress it. In other words, store it up inside or, or you know, because that could harm your body. Don't repress it. That, you know, by denying your anger, there's a word for repressed anger. It's called depression. Don't express it. That's, you know, again, uh, that's an inappropriate way, you know, maybe, maybe you do it by sarcasm or something like that. You know, maybe you're an expert at making cuts at people and manipulating or, or getting your own way or attacking or, or, or pouting or, or crazy behavior, whatever it is. Don't express it in an inappropriate way. The right way to deal with anger is to confess it. You admit it, I'm angry, I'm angry. And then even more important is to admit the cause. I'm really hurt. I'm really frustrated. I'm really afraid. When you're angry at someone and you express anger, you get more defensive. But if you say, you know, I'm afraid, their defenses go down. If you say, I'm hurt, their defenses go down. It's much easier to deal with people's fear and frustration and hurt than to deal with people's angers. Now, the next step I'm going to give you from Scripture is, is a key to kind of helping you out there, and it's number five, is, is I repattern my mind. You've got to change the way you think. If you're going to get it done, you've got to change the way you think because, you know, the way you think is the way you are. And so you need to understand that. I need to learn new ways, a way of expressing your anger the right way. It's a learned response. The way you express your anger, you learned it. You learned it. Now, since you learned how to get angry and you learned, you know, somebody modeled it for you maybe, okay? Or, or, or you know, I don't know how you d it was, but, but somebody modeled it for you and you learned how to g get angry. Here's the good news. Anything that is learned can be unlearned. It can be unlearned. Romans 12 and verse 2. Don't copy the behavior and customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing what? The way you think. By changing the way you think. Now follow me on this. You've got to repattern your mind for permanent anger management. You see, you act angry because you feel angry, and you feel angry because you're thinking angry thoughts. Okay, your thoughts determine your emotions. Your emotions, your emotions determine your actions. And if you want to break a habit of anger, then you're going to have to do some, some mental reconditioning to change the way you think. 
just look at it from a different perspective. I had a guy the other day, I was working ambulance service, and we were having a, a particularly busy day at the ambulance service. And uh, he was talking about, you know, we had all these crazy runs. It was crazy. But we got, it was about six o'clock in the evening. We had just gotten through some, I mean, some, a guy, you know, I, to, I think I told you about the guy, the wife shooting his husband in the finger. Uh, that, uh, did, that we did that one. Then we went to another one where this guy had had a uh, seizure on the bus and he got off the bus and had a seizure again, hit his head on the pavement. And then he got up again and ran down the hill and fell down the hill. He's on the bottom of the hill where all these chiggers were. And we had to go down there and get him. And I was trying to convince the police there's no way we're going to put this guy on a backboard and carry him up. We got to put him in what they call a hauler and all this, took him up. Hey, anyway, we got back in the... In the Guy I was working with me, he was talking about, man, this has been crazy. And he was talking about, this is the worst day and all this. I said, let me tell you something real quick. Number one, I said, every one of those calls we went on, oh, we went to another one that we were sure was a heart attack. We sure we, sure we was going to be, that they, this woman's going to fix the code. As soon as we got there, we got there, and she was alert and oriented, and we put her in the, and we got her. She was having some heart issues, but it wasn't nearly what. But I told him, I said, every single one of these runs we were on could have been a whole lot worse. Every one of them. I said, the guy, you know, yeah, uh, his wife shot her husband in the hand, but he, she could have shot him in the head. <laughs> and I said, you know, and then the other guy, the, I said, it could have been a whole lot. All these could have been a whole lot worse. He said, you know, come think of it, you're right. He says, every one of these ones we got on, when we, when we were heading there, we were thinking it's going to be a whole lot worse than it was. He said, I appreciate you bringing that point up to me. I need to change, and that's what he said. He said, I need to change the way I think. That's so true. You've got to repattern your mind for permanent anger management. Again, because you, you act because you feel angry, and you're, you feel angry because of the way you're thinking. Now, have you noticed that we often pick up, it's, 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 it's what scientists call mirroring, mirroring neutrons in our brain, that when other people get loud, we get loud too. Have you noticed that? Anger is contagious. It's contagious. And that's what the Bible says you need to be aware of the fact in Proverbs chapter 22 and 24, keep away from angry, short-tempered people or you'll learn to be like them. In other words, anger is contagious. Anger can inflict others. That's why you want to keep kids out of gangs because it creates anger. Now, kids learn from models that they observe and anytime you lose your temper, you're modeling that for your children. You're teaching them how to be angry. Last year, did you know 10 million kids were beaten severely by parents who simply didn't know how to control their anger? And these weren't bad people. They don't know how to control their anger. Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 29. If you exploit or abuse your family, you'll end up with a fistful of air. That's a message. Colossians 3.19 says, You husbands must love your wives. Never treat them harshly. Number six, it says, Ask God to fill me with love, with his love. Ask God, if you want to overcome it, ask God to fill you with his love. Now, this is the real secret of God's power to change you from an angry person into a peaceful person a calm person, a, a composed person, a, a heart of peace. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5, talking about love, which is a description of Jesus Christ, he says, love is not easily angered. Love is not, love is not easily angered. I am filled with God's love, almost nothing can upset me. But if I'm filled with anger, almost anything can upset me. Romans chapter 15 and verse 5 says, Patience and encouragement come from God. I pray God will help you agree with each other the way Christ Jesus wants. Patience and encouragement come from God. I pray that God will help you to agree with each other the way Jesus Christ wants. God wants you to live in harmony. 
God wants his church to live in harmony. God wants your family to live together in harmony. God wants each of us as friends and neighbors to live together in harmony. What I'm saying is your relationship to Christ, listen, will determine how patient you are. Your relationship with Christ will determine how well you master the anger in your life. You can change. I'm here to tell you the good news that even in a crisis where people are out of work and kids are at home and people have to be so isolated, you can change with God's love inside of you. You know, my, my grandkids used to have these little things that they would eat like yogurt or something like that, you know, that had like these little tubes that had applesauce in them and stuff like that. I think they were called squeeze-its. Is that what they were called? Something like that. But when you squeeze it, the stuff would come out. Whatever was inside was going to come out when you squeezed it. And when you, when you put pressure or intention, same thing goes with temper. Pressure and anger go together. You squeeze somebody enough, they're going to get angry. That's why there's an epidemic of irritability during these times, I think, in our country. A lot of people are being squeezed. And so what's inside is going to come out. My challenge to you, particularly those of you who are married and you're at home and, and your husband and your wife makes a comment to you uh, to, to, to work or manage your anger, that maybe you make a decision that you're going to do it better during this crisis. How does God help me manage my anger? Well, the Bible says in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22, he says the fruit of the Spirit is, one of them is, patience. God deals with the root cause in your life, and he wants to put fruit in your life, the fruit of patience, and, and it, it'll help you get to the root. Now, what's the root? What's the root problem, the cause of anger? Matthew chapter 12, 34 says, whatever's in your heart determines what you say. So the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. When it comes to anger, the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. The problem isn't my tongue, it, it's my heart. My mouth betrays what's really inside. We've all given the excuse, you know, I don't know why I said that. That's just not like me. Yes, it is. The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. You say what's on your heart. Now, if I got bad water in a well, painting the pump's not going to help it. I need to change the water. My mouth just betrays what's on the inside of me. I don't care how much makeup you put on. For instance, someone with a harsh tongue is revealing an angry heart. Someone with a negative tongue is revealing a, is revealing a, a fearful heart. Someone with a boastful tongue is revealing an insecure heart. Someone with an overactive tongue they're talking all the time. It reveals an unsettled heart. Someone with a guilty tongue, a judgmental tongue, is revealing a guilty heart. I'm judging you because I feel guilty. Someone with a critical tongue is revealing a bitter heart. And someone with a filthy tongue is revealing an impure heart. On the other hand, someone with an encouraging tongue, they're always giving an encouraging word. They're revealing a happy heart. Someone with a gentle tongue is revealing a loving heart. Someone with a controlled tongue is revealing a peaceful heart. What you and I need is a new heart. Fortunately, God squeezes in heart transplants. David said, create in me a clean heart, O Lord. Jesus can heal your hurting heart with love. Now, maybe in the past... You felt rejected and abused and unloved. I want you to know that Jesus cares about your pain. Your pain matters to God. Jesus can replace your frustrated heart with a piece of Jesus that the Bible describes as what? Passes all understanding. If you pick up and carry a baby and you give it warmth and acceptance, a lot of times unless it's, unless it's you know, got dirty britches on or, or it's hungry, it's going to calm down. If you, 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 you treat it with, 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 with I, I've seen this a lot. Gail and I talk about this a lot. You can tell parents that are nervous parents by just looking at their kids, by the way their kids react to things. When you start feeling secure and acceptance in God's love, your inability and your, or irritability nosedives. It nosedives. Now, what are you going to do about this? First, 
I think we need to, you need to just pray about it. Matter of fact, why don't we just pray together? Bow with me. You know, Father, it's sad but true that we often get angry at the people that we love the most. Often we get the most angry at the people we're closest to because we forget that you are the source of all we need, not others. Jesus, help us to remember that when we expect anyone other than you to meet our deepest needs, we're going to be disappointed and we're going to get angry. Father, I'm certain that there are many people listening right now who are struggling with irritability or short temper or anger due to hurt or frustration or insecurity or fear. And they're feeling that they're feeling during these difficult days. And I pray for them that today they will experience hope and healing in and, and, and a brand new way. Father, we need to admit that we have a problem with our anger. Just say, I, I admit I have a problem with my anger and I, and I need your help. Today, God, with your help, we need to resolve to learn how to manage our anger. We need to understand and be aware of the way that our anger hurts other people and ask for forgiveness to control things and get the, the, then getting angry. Help to reflect before reacting. Father, we just need to come to you and ask to reflect before reacting. Help me to learn to release my anger appropriately. Help me to learn to repattern my mind with your word. The most important is all, say, Jesus Christ, today I open up my life completely to your love. Fill, my, fill me with your love. Fill me with a love that has pushed out all the irritability and all the anger. Father, just save me and change me. And make the challenge in me and the changes in me that only you can make. That we can trust you with our lives. For it is in Christ's name that we do pray. And amen. Maybe today this is an issue that you deal with that you maybe need the prayers of the church. Maybe you need to make that right today. Whatever your need might be, maybe you need to become a Christian. Maybe you need to start that walk. You start that walk by coming down, confessing your faith, being baptized in the name of Jesus, having your sins washed away, be added to the body of Christ. And then you can have a new you, a changed you. And he will continue to work in you to create in you, create you into the image of Christ. If we can help you this morning in any way, I want to encourage you to come as we stand. We offer the invitation.